I'd like to also bring that over to psychosis and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which, you know, these experiences, I mean, I believe strongly that awakening experiences should be interpreted as experiences in their own right, as, you know, profound experiences that have the potential to unlock uh, innate human potential and and allow people to live more wholesome um, and joyful lives. But they can, or there are definitely overlaps with mental health disorders. And um, it's really important to mention that and you know that mental health disorders are also a thing and whilst there are overlaps and interlinks and we don't quite know how they how these experiences merge or how similar they are how different they are because not enough research has been conducted on spiritual awakening experiences but you know certainly we need to be aware that we're talking about you know very extreme psycho spiritual states and sometimes people need uh you know professional help and and they might even need medication for certain disorders particularly if they're distressing if they're not distressing then that's for another conversation and and perhaps something that we we shouldn't be de- debating right now but um but yeah exactly you I, know I, I was i was actually i was gonna go there afterwards but let's let's go there right now and maybe this other question i had is relevant later or maybe not um because this is actually something that, as you can imagine, came up in my conversation with Analakitis around um, sort of pathologizing or psychopathologizing of spiritual experience. Um, and there being this weird balance between, okay, so is this a spiritual experience or is this somebody experiencing a psychotic episode, right? How do we, how do we, track the difference in those things because they can seem very, very similar from the outside. And I remember, uh, I know, I know that in one of the DSMs, they introduced a new disorder called like religious or spiritual issues or something to be like, Hey, also it isn't actually helpful to treat somebody who's having a spiritual experience as if they are having, you know, the, uh, borderline personality disorder or like schizophrenia or it is, oh, this person is, is suffering from classic depersonalization, you know, um, because path- um, psychologizing that experience can actually do more harm than not. Um, and simultaneously, this person could actually be going through a psychotic episode and needs like clinical intervention, perhaps even pharmaceutical intervention to to minimize potentially large amounts of harm. And then there's this whole weird context where we don't know what's what or, you know, maybe. Okay. So here's the question then. Now that I comment on that as much I'll as you try like, and it. but <laughs> the que- yeah, the question is, you know, when I listen to you talk about your experience, I think you had, you had mentioned, you know, the challenge of making sense of it afterwards. And when you spoke about the negative, um, the negative experiences, generally you had said like, oh, this person didn't have a context for the experience. And so it was scary and overwhelming and, and, or didn't have a context afterwards that made it so that they could actually digest this in their life. What is your sort of take on the sort of, when I say our culture, I sort of mean the sort of dominant Western culture that is literally dominating and over overtaking the planet this sort of like western mind which i don't have any particular problem with it's just a particular thing but no i have a problem with the domination i don't think there's <laughs> anything fundamentally wrong fundamentally wrong with western mindset or something but um what do you see about the culture that we're in and why it is that the context of that culture leads to negative experiences both during and afterwards I think um, there's a real lack of lack of understanding uh, of these experiences, scientifically speaking and and psychologically speaking. Like I said earlier, we don't know where the boundary or if there even is a boundary between, you know, lies between spiritual experiences and mental health disorders. But what the West has tended to do is to pathologize the experience by default, and that in itself is harmful towards people who have, you know any sort of spiritual experience actually um, because it already de- invalidates the experience and that in itself can be extremely harmful mm. 
to the experiencer because not only might somebody find themselves without the context through which to understand the experience, not only might they not have a community through which to discuss the experience, but they also innately have and subconscious it's deeply embedded in our subconscious that if we have anything that is kind of that falls outside the boundaries of what we know to be normality yeah we'll we'll consider ourselves insane by default and that idea that we're insane can also be incredibly harmful especially because it's not a given that if you have an experience that falls outside this boundary of what we know to be real or what we know to be true um it's not a given that that's not a better way of living than what falls within this back bracket. I'm, I don't know if I'm making sense. It's making sense in my mind. But what I'm trying to say, and in summary, is that uh, the pathologization of these experiences can be really, really harmful. And what we need is an increase in 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 in, sci in the science of uh, or, or an increased understanding of the science and the, the neurology and the neuroscience and the psychology of these experiences in order to better inform uh, individuals undergoing the experience, but also clinicians who are working with individuals having these kinds of extreme experiences and informing them how to best handle the experience as well. Um, because I don't think that medical the medicalization of these experiences is, um, is fair as a first course of action Evidently, if somebody needs more attention, then yes, certainly they can take medication for it. Uh, or even initially, whatever, it's up to each individual. I just think that we, that clinicians and psychologists should have a better uh, kind of first call of action um, to dealing with people who are undergoing extreme psycho-spiritual states, including spontaneous ritual awakenings. Um, I've spoken to a number of people who said that they had the most blissful unitive experience so they didn't feel that they were going in insane and in fact a common feature of of these experiences and obviously it's not the same for everybody but a common feature is that the experience feels realer than real mm. so i've had conversations with people where they've expressed that they had this blissful realer than real experience where they found themselves this sense of inner peace this sense of inner knowing of connection of empathy of love and they went to that the experience was still overwhelming. So they went to their mental health provider or their clinician and they, they discussed their experience openly and they were suddenly sort of prescribed medication for it. And I don't think that's the fair, the fairest way to go about these kinds of experiences. I think they need to be treated individually, first of all, because not all experiences are the same. Some are negative, some are positive. How can we support people undergoing both extremes, you know, as well. I don't think there should be a one size fits all uh, kind of, um, um, yeah, way of dealing with these experiences. Uh, and I think that can be extremely harmful. Mm -hmm. And also the tabooness, sorry, uh, just Please. to conclude, the tabooness of these experiences. Not sure if that's even a word, tabooness, but yeah, <laughs> uh, the fact that these experiences are so tabooed. Um, make it so difficult for people to come out of their spiritual closet as well. Um, and so, you know, again, that holding of it, withholding of information and that holding it in when for people, for many people, it's the most blissful and incredible or even non-blissful, even most terrifying, but it's an experience that is so strong and yet they're not able to express themselves openly. That is also extremely harmful. And that's why I think spaces like your, um, your psychedelic cafe, I think you called it, mm -hmm. um, are really, really important. And it's actually the basis of, of the, I run some, uh, spiritual awakening sharing circles as well in London in person. Um, and that was the basis, um, through which that was birthed because I found there was a real need for people to have a safe, non judgmental space where they could talk about these experiences openly, whether they were negative or positive, and just be more content and more at peace through the knowing that they could speak about them openly. Mm. I got, I'm holding, I'm holding three things. Um, I like your, you're sort of like, you're, well, this is the fourth thing, the way that you made, you're making like a call for a kind of change 
in how we're able to understand and how clinicians are showing up to these experiences. And um, that was, it's just like, I feel it and I'm, it was beautiful. And, th and thank you for making that call and for doing your work to continue to sort of like, not only make the call, but give some substance to hand out at the same time. Be like, you gotta do this. And like, here's a bunch of data to help us. Um, but then the three things, one of which is just like totally ridiculous. I was thinking about the word taboo and to, to taboo a thing. And then I thought about when we taboo and it's like, oh, you tabooed that it was like a taboo boo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> taboo boo. Um, we don't anyways. have that in England. <laughs> it's a Canadian thing. <laughs> I just, it just came into my head right now. I don't know if it's real. Love that. This is the beginning. Somebody listening, please put that on Urban Dictionary. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but is it the, a rude uh, word? It's not a rude word, is it? The boo boo. Yeah, no, well, it's a cute one. Yeah, taboo, and then like, oh, I, ow, I have a boo boo, like a little, like yeah, a yeah, kid, yeah. Like, I have a boo boo. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, what were the what were the two other ones? Uh, one of which is like listening to your call, like your call for this sort of like shift. I realized just like how immense of a challenge that is given the actual structure of the very um, the fields of study that would need to integrate this. You know, how does a field of study almost entirely rooted on biological psychiatry to assess what are a person's symptoms, how do I associate it with a brain issue, a, a brain deficiency, and what medications do I give them to fix the brain problem so their symptoms go away? Like that's predominantly from what I understand sort of like clinical psychiatry, at least in Canada, that's sort of the baseline, right? Um, that's not, I think, up to date with what the actual science says, but clinical practice in the public generally, I imagine is pretty far behind from what the most cutting edge science is. Um, the challenge of that and the challenge of, you know, as a larger cultural institution, you know, like I, I, I recently interviewed Martin Sh uh, Martin Sherp, from Synthesis Institute in the Netherlands. And there was a little bit a part of the conversation where we talked about the difference between integrating psychedelics into mainstream institutions and psychedelicizing those institutions so that psychedelics fit inside of them. Um, and that being a very important, important difference. And uh, yeah, just sort of recognizing the scope of the challenge and the scope of the conversation if we were to start to dive into what's happening with the structure now and why is it such a challenge and just kind of like leaving that as an open wondering for people listening. Mm -hmm.